Hi everyone, my name's Eleanor and I'm the Education Manager at Benjamin Franklin House. I'm so delighted to be welcoming you to this family edition of our Ben's Book Club. This is a monthly series where we in interview authors who have been writing about books relating to the 18th century, to American history and also to Benjamin Franklin himself. And this month we are so delighted to be welcoming Michael J. Rosen, um, who is the creator of more than 150 books both for adults and young readers. He's a poet, an editor, writer of fiction and nonfiction, an illustrator, a ceramic artist, a playwright, and companion um, animal to a cattle dog called Chance. <laughs> Welcome, Michael. Oh, um, I hate hearing about myself. That's so funny. <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. Delighted and, to be here. And it's, um, so today I'm going to be handing over to Michael in a moment so that he can read from his book, um, Ben of All Trades, The Most Inventive Boyhood of Benjamin Franklin. And then we're going to have a bit of a conversation. I'm going to ask Michael some questions and then we'll be handing over to you also so you can ask some questions. You can do that either by typing in the chat or by pressing the raise hand button and then I can unmute your microphone and you can ask your questions over the audio. So let's get up the pages from your brilliant book and I'll hand over to Michael. Here we are. So this is a book that I was asked to write, um, looking at a particular moment, an important moment in a young famous person's life. So I chose Ben Franklin. We'll talk about why in a minute. But one of the things that he's best known for, and I knew of when I was a child, were his his sayings, his proverbs. And this book begins with one of them from his famous collection. So this is almost 300 years ago. He wrote this. Hide not your talents. They for use were made. What's a sundial in the shade? That has a nice rhyme to it. And I suspect you're already thinking, well, how can there be a sundial if it's in the shade? So we'll begin the book uh, with the first page here. What did Ben Franklin love about books? Each one was nothing like another. What did Benjamin not love about making candles. Each one was in every way like others. He measured wicks, melted tallow, and thickened each candle, dipping, 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 daydreaming. His father desperately needed to find his son a trade that suited his talents. But practicing swimming strokes, endlessly reading. All Benjamin desired was to be a sailor. All he appeared to be was an aimless wool gatherer. Lately, the boy was obsessed with The Art of Swimming, a book from his father's library. In the light of his own hands, identical candles, he has studied every stroke. Neck deep and naked in Mill Pond, Benjamin gripped two wooden paddles he'd carved. Ten, nine, eight, his sister Lydia counted down from shore. Go! Gulping air, Benjamin bowed bounded forward, whirling his arms. His paddles spanked and tugged the water beneath him. Whap, whoosh, whap, whoosh. His kicking churned a bubbly wake. <clears throat> Lifting his head, he sucked in air again. Whap, whoosh, whap, whoosh. Finally, at the dock, he spun around. 40 seconds, Lydia explained, twice as fast. At supper, a very excited Benjamin presented his fins. 
Thumbs go in these holes. He slipped on the paddles. They afford your hands the mightiest power. Quite inventive, truly, his father Josiah pronounced. But no, my answer is still no. Father, I'd be a superb sailor. The sea has shown no benevolence to our family, Josiah said. Besides, candles are something people always need. I fear my mind is unsuited for the craft, sir. So that's an excerpt at the very beginning. And I'm sure there are a couple words maybe that you don't know, uh, that I didn't know when I was writing the book, but I wanted to capture a little bit of how people spoke back then and the fact that a child would call his father, sir. Not many of us do that now, but that was very common for the time. Wool gathering doesn't mean going out and getting wool. It just means kind of daydreaming aimlessly, you know, puttering around. So uh, that was part of the pleasure in writing, kind of using a tight rope of what sounds really good and what sounds, oh, that's too confusing. So I will turn it over to Eleanor. Thank you so much, Michael. It's always just amazing to hear um, an author read their, from their own work. And um, you started to tell us a little bit about the origins of the project. So I just wondered um, if you could say a bit more about what drew you to writing about Benjamin Franklin. Um, uh, uh, you know, every time I have to make a sound like the whoosh and whap, and I always think, oh boy, here we go. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a little theatrical. But um, what I loved about the Ben Franklin Commission, I was asked to write a story about a famous person. And it could be anyone super famous that you know anyone would like to know more about. But I had to find something unique that wasn't already well known. And I knew that Benjamin Franklin, I was a very big swimmer when I was a kid. It was the one thing I did well and uh, I could challenge myself to do. Well, I remember that Ben Franklin made swim paddles and I used to swim with swim fins. And I, so I looked into that. Um, of course, I also knew that he did something with a kite and electricity and water, but, but that wasn't a real motivation. And then when I found out uh, that swimming back then, there were no swimming pools, there were no bathing suits. No one went in the water unless they fell in the water or they were rescuing someone in the water. So the fact that he chose to go swimming and without clothes, I just thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna be a very uh, appealing episode to share with kids. So the more that I found out about it and almost everything that I have came from his own autobiography, which didn't spend a lot of time on his childhood, but there was enough there that I felt I could embody the voice and the character and the motives of young Benjamin Franklin in order to craft a story. That's brilliant. That was actually my next question was going to be about kind of how you found out more about Benjamin Franklin. But we're lucky with with um, with with Ben that we have his autobiography as a, as a source to go to. You know, there there is that. And then I also read some, you know, really thick books uh, uh, that were biographies not written by Ben Franklin. And there is so much material because he was such an important figure uh, in so many ways as a statesman, as an inventor, you know, as a journalist, uh, as a, uh, a, a, a um, ambassador. So, so there, was a, there was enough material. Um, and then once Matt Tavares got a hold of the material, he had his own version, which we'll talk about later. So I would say my 
my job was most difficult in that I had to tell Ben Franklin's autobiography that he did write about his childhood, but not intended for children. So I had to figure out how do you tell that same story to a young reader? That's wonderful. And um, hopefully you saw during the reading all the beautiful um, illustrations by Matt Tavares. And of course, that's kind of telling uh, with, a, with a book with pictures like this, you're telling the story together with the illustrator. So I just wondered a bit about how that what that relationship is like working together as an author and illustrator. I think most people think that, you know, the author um, chooses the illustrator and they sit side by side and they think about what to do. And the exact opposite is true. I have my editor who works on the writing and Matt has his editor who works on the drawings. And the two editors talk, but I don't talk to the illustrator. That's very typical. I see the sketches, I respond to the sketches. And in this case, Matt responded to the story because when I first wrote it, the commission was write a story based on a boyhood episode of Ben Franklin. But once Matt got involved, he does so much historical research. He hires models, he rents costumes, he goes to authentic uh, restored uh, places and takes photographs. Well, some things didn't ring true. And he wrote me through my editor a long list of, I don't see where this is mentioned. I didn't realize, where did you see this? So I revised it in order to make some things absolutely true rather than based on. And at the back of the book, you'll see there's a list of where I say, okay, in case you're, you've got your magnifying glass and you're, and you're sleuthing for what changes I made, here they are. So uh, Matt did some just remarkable work making, um, making the pictures um, you know, uh, richly evocative of the time with lots of, you know, action and um, uh, uh, really a way that you could jump right into the pool with him. I mean, here's Ben Franklin swimming with his feet tied with his belt. I mean, I don't know, but I think it's a very interesting challenge for an illustrator to say, okay, I'm just gonna draw a couple big feet uh, right in the middle of uh, this colonial uh, atmosphere. So he did a great, a great job. We're very happy with it. It's a, it's really a beautiful book, and um, hopefully our attendees have, have read it already. But if not, do do get your hands on a copy. Um, and then, so having kind of got to know Benjamin Franklin this way, I wondered if you had a favorite um, fact or about him or saying of his. Um, that you, that you care to share? Oh, uh, I do love Poor Richard's Almanac, that collection of proverbs, because they just sort of ran through, uh, I think my growing up and even my adult life. And there were many st statements that he made or proverbs that he made that really did shape what colonial America uh, might be. What are the virtues? Let's be thrifty, let's be honest, let's be uh, generous, let's be patient. All those things he put in words that made it uh, charming, like a friend in need is a friend indeed. I mean, I never knew it was Ben Fry, but yes, he, he said that, 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 you know, being a, a friend, being uh, helpful, or fish and visitors stink in three days meaning I guess, don't overstay your welcome. Uh, and my favorite thing that I found again when doing my research here, and again, this is almost 300 years ago, he said, there was never a good war or a bad peace. You know that we are now in 2021 and we have plenty of bad wars and bad pieces, you know, it's just so, uh, what's, an, what's a simpler word than prescient? So, uh, uh, 
so uh, indicative of his, his uh, bearing in the world, his knowledge that uh, it's just rings so true today. Absolutely. I think one of the things he said was that he felt he'd been born 100 years too soon. Um, and I think we can see that in <laughs> some of his inventions, the things he said. Um, I think he would have been really interested in everything that's happening at the moment, all of the very quick um, kind of advancements that are being made, everyone adapting to, um, to conversations like this via Zoom and um, all of those things. <laughs> um, I would rather be, I think I'm born 100 too late. I think I'd be, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. You never know. You only have the one, you can't compare with yourself. You know, Absolutely. you only have this version. Absolutely. Um, and Michael, what are you working on now? What's your current project? So I've, I have uh, loved writing more than I've loved subject matter. Like if you told me, do you want to write a book about Benjamin Franklin? I would have said, I mean, not as, I mean, not, I mean, I wasn't thinking of that, but tell me to think about it. And then I get to do the, the thing I do well, which is uh, read, problem solve, respond. I mean, I think if another author were to be given the same commission, they wouldn't have had the reason to pick this set of scenes. But I found myself in that. As a kid, I was multiply, whether it was talented or interested, I, I did a lot of things, some of them sort of well. And even now, as you said at the very beginning, as everybody watched me blush, I mean, I, I draw and I paint and I do ceramics and I write and, um, and Ben's, uh, what, you know, uh, I think another word that I do use in the, in the book is polymath. I mean, meaning poly meaning many, he knows how to do many things. Um, and I think that there are many kids who are pressured the way Ben was pressured. Make a decision, you need to be responsible. What are you going to do? Now, maybe if you're not in elementary school, but you know, shortly thereafter, there's, there's a pressure not to, not to try and dream and, and be creative, but instead to focus and study and aim. Um, and so I wanted to have Ben Franklin as perhaps just another example of how uh, opportunities could come that weren't maybe expected or weren't, you know, uh, built just around one expectation or talent. And that actually makes a terrific uh, transition to my next book, um, which is a book called How to Spacewalk. So that leaps a little forward from colonial times into uh, the space shuttle. But I have a friend who uh, took three shuttle missions for NASA here in the United States. And she was the first American woman to step outside the spaceship. Now, me, I don't climb on a ladder. I don't go high. You know, I, I, I get dizzy if you put like a piece of black paper on the floor. It's like, ah, I don't want to, you know. But um, Kathy Sullivan uh, is a doctor a uh, NASA scientist and oceanographer and explorer. And she was someone as a young person who was a wool gatherer. She was a scientist and explorer at a very young age. She was curious. And so this book is not just about how to spacewalk, but it's also a book for young people to, to say there are opportunities. And sometimes you knock and sometimes you knock louder. When she went to school, no women really, excuse me, few women were in the sciences. And Kathy was one of the first, you know, uh, doctors and uh, people recruited for the space program. So this book, you know, is another kind of a, 
of Benjamin Franklin, extraordinary, use your talents, don't be a sundial in the shade kind of a book. That sounds so I'm going to write written and now I'm going to illustrate it. And if everyone's patient, it will be out not next year, but the one after that. Takes a long time. It sounds really exciting. And, th and this was somebody that you knew before starting the book. Correct. We decided to do the book together and then our publisher agreed to, uh, to create it. That's fantastic. Well, Michael, thank you so much. It's been just wonderful to hear, well, hear you read, hear more about a Benevol Trades and, and what you're working on currently. I wonder if any of our um, attendees had any questions they wanted to ask Michael about his, his books he's written previously or what he's working on now. You can either type in the, in the chat uh, and we'll read out your questions, or if you press the raise hand button, there should be a little icon which with a, with a hand, if you press that, then I can exactly, I can um, unmute your microphone and we'll hear you over the audio. So um, do let us know either in the chat or by the raise hand if you have any questions for Michael. Um, while we're waiting to see if we have any responses, I wonder, Michael, because as you, like Ben Franklin, um, do so many different things. And when, when you do um, illustrate books that you, you've written as well, would you normally start with, with the words and, and, and then work on the illustrations or um, does it sometimes go the other way around? I have never done illustration first. Um, and I think it's very, uh, very unlikely that someone would, because uh, I think illustrations, if you're doing them in a, sequence they have to have some kind of a narrative going on um i mean i've tried a couple times but for the for the basic practices i have a text and often it's someone else's text that i then try to um draw to you know one of the things that i learned early on um and i think it may be helpful to share is that while the word illustration means put this into a picture, put this word into a picture, um, an illustrator, particularly for picture books, is doing much more than that. I think that they are inventing the rest of the world that you hadn't pictured. So if I were to say um, uh, just a simple thing like, you know, Michael and Chant were out for a walk. Now, I haven't said what kind of trees are out there. What is the season? What's the weather? What are they wearing? The illustrator completes that world in a way that the author didn't, didn't know. And unless they do something like completely peculiar, like decide that Michael is going to be a grandfather and that you know the dog is going to be a dinosaur, uh, you know, if you don't specify what kind of dog or it's important that they were wearing, you know, robes and crowns, the illustrator magically, really uh, delightfully creates the rest of the world. That's so true, especially with, with picture books. It's such an important part. And I can see that one of our attendees has um, said how they were late joining and asked if there's going to be a recording. And we are recording. So I can um, send that to everyone who's joined after as well. Um, uh, please do let us know if you have any, any more questions that you'd like to ask Michael. I have one more question from me, which is um, I know that uh, writers and artists are always looking to other writers and artists for inspiration. And I just wondered if um, there were any in particular that were inspiring to you? Oh, gosh, I mean, I, I always like squirm, squirm with those kinds of questions because there, there are, I'm such an avid, I mean, this is just one little corner of one of my libraries. I mean, depending on what the subject is, I have people that I look to, to inspire me, uh, both in writing and in drawing. So um, like right now, I'm challenging myself to do more painting. I wanna do more 
paintings on canvas. And so I'm looking at, you know, Henri Matisse, and I'm looking at Cezanne, and I'm looking at Milton Avery, and, you know, a number of, of people, because I, I think it's great to imitate, because you, you can't imitate very long without it becoming your own. So I always encourage uh, young people to imitate a writer they love, imitate a, an illustrator, and then another one, and then another one. And eventually you're gonna digest all those and you're gonna be you. So I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, a well-digested, uh, you know, everything that I take in, uh, I feel like I, I have learned from, um, or um, this is the part where I say, I've learned from and yet I haven't got everything right. So I think your style, your voice, is everything you've tried and everything you haven't exactly got right. <laughs> thanks so much, Michael. And I can't see any questions from attendees, but um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, and Michael, just thank you so much again for joining us for Ben's Book Club. It was, it's just been wonderful to hear you read and, and thank you for your brilliant answers to our questions. My pleasure. Anything further, just you know where I am. <laughs> thanks I'll so much. Have a good day, everyone, wherever you are. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>